All right. Imagine with me for a moment that you are a student or a staff member at a small college in southern Manitoba. I know, I know. OK, I'll give you a second to sit by that tank in and to roll your eyes. But bear with me. It's the middle of the winter semester. You've just returned from a mind blowing, awe inspiring missions trip, and you're pumped about finishing off the semester with renewed energy and vision. Excited about the SBC community and what God is going to teach you next. Then, bam, a mysterious unknown virus sends everyone packing. The world around you is full of fear and panic. Suddenly, all the expectations you had about finishing off the year with friends around you are cut short. No more face to face classes, no end of the year parties, no graduation, just you alone with only Microsoft Teams for connection. Definitely not how you envisioned this year to end. So what do you do when your expectations are shattered? This weekend was Easter, where we remember the darkness and despair of the cross on Friday. Often churches celebrate with communion. Then we celebrate Christ's resurrection and triumph over death and darkness on Sunday. But seldom do we think about or celebrate Saturday. Sometimes I think we miss out on the sorrow of Friday because when we celebrate Good Friday, we already know that Sunday is coming. But what was happening in the disciples' minds that day? Sure, Jesus had told them he would rise again on the third day, but did they believe it? Did they understand? Today, I want us to think about Saturday, the in-between Friday and Sunday day, because I believe that much of our life is spent living on Saturday, that in-between time of uncertainty, doubt, fear, and questioning, much like the world right now in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's go back to Saturday. Imagine with me for a moment what it would have been like to be one of Jesus's disciples. You've been taught all your life that the Messiah was going to come and save you from your oppression and gather Israel together again as one nation whom no one could overthrow again. For the last three years, you have followed around this teacher who his closest friends claim is the real Messiah. At first, you're a bit skeptical. There have been claims of the Messiah before, all of which have turned out false. Some of these false messiahs have even brought about peace in the nation for a time. Why would this man be any different? But for some reason, you're drawn to him. The one they claim is the son of God. You followed him around, watched him feed 5,000 people with one small basket lunch, watched him heal the sick, give sight to the blind. You've heard him teach and speak to thousands with words that had authority and power. And somewhere in the mix, you've grown to believe, as the other disciples, that this man is the true Messiah, the one that will save Israel from her enemies and establish peace once again. The excitement of this last week had pushed your hopes up even higher as your Messiah, the King, rode into Jerusalem on a young colt, just as the prophets had prophesied that the Messiah would do. People hailed him as the Messiah, the son of David, and it seems that they have all come to see the truth as you have. Then your hopes and dreams come crashing down as the religious rulers have had your Messiah, your King, arrested and crucified. Not only has your teacher, whom you have followed for three years, died, but all your hopes and dreams and expectations have died along with him. What now? I can only imagine what the disciples did on that afternoon. The Bible doesn't tell us what they did. And I suppose we could research what customs surrounding funerals and mourning would have looked like during that time. But I'm not really convinced that the disciples would have followed the customary practices anyway. Not when their teacher had been crucified as a rebel. Any association with him would have been placing their own lives in danger. But if I think about the deaths that I've experienced in my life, I can imagine that the disciples would have found a way to meet together, most likely in secret considering the circumstances. They would have reminisced about their time with Jesus. They would have recalled the miracles they witnessed. 
the teaching they heard, things Jesus said and did. They will have wondered what they would be doing right now if Jesus were still here. What would Jesus have done in this situation? They will have remembered the people that Jesus raised from the dead and wondered about the things Jesus said that still didn't make sense to them. Some of them will have expressed doubt. Some will have feared. What's going to happen to us now? They would have gone through their mental picture books, laughing, crying, questioning. Some of them were angry, some terrified, some only worried. They wondered whether all their hopes and dreams of the Messiah, if they were all for nothing. Had they wasted three years following after some man who wasn't worth their time? What was the point of that? Where would they go now? Where would they turn? A few of them were concerned about Jesus' tomb and making sure the proper burial arrangements had been made. And once the Sabbath was over, some of the women went to Jesus' tomb to anoint his body with the proper burial oils. Did any of the disciples remember Jesus' words, telling them he would rise on the third day? The women returned, claiming that Jesus' body had disappeared from the tomb and that angels had told them Jesus was alive. Do you believe them? A woman's testimony didn't count for much in those days. Jesus was dead. There was no chance that he is now alive. That would have been impossible. But do you dare hope? Peter and John ran out after the woman, women had returned to see for themselves, and like the women said, Jesus' body was gone. You wonder what happened. You aren't sure what to do, where to go. Your dreams have been dashed to pieces and things just seem to be getting worse. Not only has Jesus died, but now his body is missing. So eventually you and another disciple decide there isn't much hope left and you're gonna go home. You've already stayed an extra day hoping that God might do something, but your hopes are running out. You're giving up, going home, checking out, back to the life you had before you met the prophet. This is where we find the two disciples in Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, we find the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I'll let you go and read uh, that story for yourself later on. Basically, the story goes like this. The two disciples are heading out from Jerusalem. They're chatting with each other about what's happened. And while they're discussing these things, Jesus comes up and walks with them. But they don't recognize him. He asks them why they're looking so sad. So they start explaining all the things that have happened, all their expectations, and how these expectations have kind of died along with, with Jesus. But he says to them, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. And he starts from the beginning and explains everything that was said to him, them in the scriptures about himself. When they approach the village to where they're going, Jesus acts as if he's gonna go further but they urge him to stay with them. For it's nearly evening. And while they were at the table together, he broke bread and that's when they recognized him and he just disappeared. Now they're so excited that they get up at once and return to Jerusalem. And here they find the 11 and exclaim how it's true that the Lord has risen. I love this story. But I think it also has some good news for us in this time of uncertainty in our lives too. And so I wanna pull out a few points from the story. First of all, sometimes our expectations don't match God's plan. See, the disciples had expectations of the Messiah. They had plans, hopes, dreams, thoughts about how everything would turn out. And in these verses in verse 19 to 24, tell us how their expectations were, what they were. And the disciples were walking along with downcast faces because their plans, their expectations about the Messiah had fallen apart. For us, this being a part thing away from all of community was not what any of us were expecting. But in the midst of it, God still has a plan, even if we don't know what it is yet. Our expectations may have crashed, but God's plan hasn't. Number two, Jesus walks with us through our doubts. I love the story of these two disciples. They're checking out, they're going home, they're heading out of town. Guess who joins them? Jesus does. 
They've all but given up on him. They're heading out of town, away from everybody else, and Jesus goes to walk with them. Jesus doesn't give up on them, even though they're seemingly giving up on him. Numbers three and four go together. In the midst of doubt, we often fail to recognize Jesus's presence. And number four, Jesus changes our perspective so that we can recognize him. See, in their heartache, these disciples didn't recognize Jesus when he joined them. They thought he was a stranger who knew nothing of what was going on in Jerusalem. They could only see one side of the story, the one where their expectations didn't line up with what was happening. What they don't see is God's side of the story. So Jesus comes along with them in their despair and he shows them what it's like. Number five, when we finally recognize God, we can't wait to share the good news. See, when the, when the disciples finally got it, they were pumped. And they get up and they run right back to Jerusalem. No waiting for morning, no complaining about how tired they were. They just get up and run back to Jerusalem, excited to share with the disciples what they have seen and, and heard from Jesus. And I'm looking forward to the time when we are back together again in person, looking back at this particular time in our lives. And I can only imagine about the amazing stories I'm gonna hear about how God was working in and through you during this time. I think that sometimes God puts difficult situations in our lives to help us grow. If things would always go as we expect, there wouldn't be much to our faith. And I'm reminded of the words from the song, Trust in You. The chorus goes like this. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust in you. At times, God moves mountains for us, parts the sea so we can walk through on dry land, and gives us answers that we cry out for. But other times, I have to believe that God puts mountains in our path so that we can learn to climb. He puts rivers in front of us so that we can learn to swim. And he doesn't give us all the answers. He just walks alongside of us and asks him to trust him. In our lifetime, we will face many difficulties, many dashed hopes and unfulfilled expectations. COVID-19 has thrown all of us for a loop. So many things are uncertain. Plans for summer and even the fall are on hold. Will they happen as we expect? In the midst of these times, God is sovereign and his plan is still perfect. He will walk alongside us when we feel like giving up or checking out. And when we have walked through those troubles, we will look back and recognize that God's plan was good and that he was with us, no matter how alone or discouraged we felt at the time. I wanna send you off with these words from Isaiah and may they be an encouragement to you as we go about the rest of the week. Isaiah 55 verse eight to 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you for watching this chapel service. If you'd like to see a few others, you can click the subscribe button or the link to the other videos.